Okay, hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Paul Adams. This is my first time at this conference. It's actually my first time in Taiwan as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, for being very welcoming. Um, I feel very much at home here. It's been a great conference so far. So, I'm going to be talking about groupware. And groupware is um, typically seen as industrial software and certainly not something that in the free software world we think about so much because it's, it's not interesting. And what was exciting for me when I stood at the back of the room here and I was watching Aaron's talk was that, um, I don't know, maybe about five or six laptops were open and people were using Facebook. There was three or four others open and they were using Google+. And what these people probably didn't realize is they are using modern groupware. It's not the classic model, but these things are modern groupware. If you think about what you can do with especially Google Plus these days, you can arrange events, invite, invite people to those events, then of course you've got the whole Google Mail uh, working with that, you have Google Calendar, so if you say you are going to an event, all of a sudden you find this event appears in your calendar. This is groupware, just not as we know it. And this is what I want to talk about today. In addition to that, um, I want to pick up on the theme that Aaron started with their keynote when they talked about free software starts with the individual and it's all about the coming together of the people to make magic happen. And in this talk I really want to take that to the next level because I'm going to talk about how not what happens when individuals come together but what happens when projects come together, when two completely different communities come together and, and work on a common goal, what can be achieved there? Aaron, how do I make that go? No, you've got too many windows. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, Where's Groupware app at the moment? Um, I mentioned Facebook and Google+. I'm going to come back to those. For now, I'm going to look at it purely from the industrial perspective, the, the enterprise software definition for, for Groupware. And the truth is the market moves very slowly. Uh, and the reason for this is typically when a market moves slowly is because somebody controls that market. And Surprise, surprise, um, depending on where you are in the world, your market leader is either Microsoft Exchange or perhaps Lotus Notes, um, depending on where you are. Um, and these are tools which are not particularly radically changed over time. Yes, perhaps the web client gets a bit prettier, or perhaps they make the mobile phone syncing more efficient, but the technology is fundamentally not changing. And certainly the kind of data that is being handled is not changing. We're still talking about email, calendar, tasks, all the classic uh, groupware content. And what it means is, when you look at how groupware used to be used, and here I'm gonna, you have to forgive me, I'm going to use the word stuff, um, but when you look at the stuff that we used to use um, in our day-to-day -day lives, the events that we put in our calendars, the, the email, the tasks, these are things that we had lying around and we wanted to keep lying around but somehow get back easily. So search, of course, was always important. When you think about modern PIM, if you think about the person using Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus or any of these other services, it's not data that's lying around. It's data that you pretty much throw away immediately. But then a month down the line, you might just want it back. Um, anyone who's ever tried to get back a message that they put on Facebook or Google Plus a month previous or two months previous, it's not easy um, because they're designed to be data that you throw away. But it's still PIM data, it's still personal information that you're throwing out there. Um, and at some point you might want to tie it together to an event or get it back. And PIM data is also changing fast. It's not just that it's going out there and not coming back, but what we call PIM data is, is changing fast. Um, I don't know, maybe six years ago, no one really talked about microblogging, and now it's everywhere. Certainly no one was talking about the likes of Google Plus or Facebook, and now they are everywhere. 
And now we've gone through a phase where we're talking about um, anything that's geolocated. So all of a sudden, you can't just tweet. You also have to say where you are when you tweet. Or Foursquare will, will put a message to say, I am now the mayor of this hotel, which actually happened to me this morning. I'm now the mayor of a hotel in town. Um, and the problem is, the reason the, the market is moving slow is because whilst the data is changing, the people who control the top end of the market, the, the Microsofts and the, the Lotus Notes of this world, are um, they're not keeping up with the change of data. They want you to keep using the same old stuff. And I'm sorry for using the word stuff. I'm going to continue to use the word stuff. But this is what they want. They want you to keep using everything that you have been doing before um, because they're very focused on the enterprise market and not, for want of a better word, the everyman. Um, before I continue a little bit about myself, since I am new to this conference, um, I am Paul Adams. Uh, I am a software engineer. I have a PhD in software engineering. Um, don't ever ask me to write a line of code. Um, I can do some wonderful things with Emacs that will break your project. Um, guaranteed. Cast iron guarantee. I will break your project. Um, my research was all to do with human interaction in free software projects, which is why I was really pleased to see um, Aaron pick up on the theme of individuals working together. Because this is what my research is all about, is how did the people working together produce this fantastic software, and how can we make the people work together more efficiently? And that's what I'm really focused on. Um, in my day job, um, I work on Colab. Um, I'm one of the directors of the business behind the technology. Um, I also um, contribute my, my business skills and my research skills to the KDE project. Um, I'm very passionate about KDE. It's actually from KDE that I became involved with, with Colab. Because um, as we're going to talk about a little bit shortly, the main desktop client for the Colab Groupware server is actually a piece of KDE technology. And I'm involved with a few other bodies. I'm involved with the Free Software Foundation for Europe. I'm involved with the Open Forum Academy and a few other bodies. In, in short, um, free software is my life's work. You can look at me as a fatter version of Aaron Saigo, if you will. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how Colab works, not what it does. I'm going to come to what it does in a, in a, in a moment. Um, if you look at it, it's a as you'd expect, client-server model, the server is um, very secure. Um, the credentials of the user are passed all the way through from, from, uh, from client to server to client, including the crypto as well, by the way, um, which is very nice. Um, it means, for example, um, because we use Cyrus as our storage, um, if you can physically compromise a server, um, there's no one set of credentials that will get you all the data. Um, if you can be lucky enough to unlock one person's credentials, um, you can at least maybe get one person's data if you're very lucky. Um, if the environment spread over many servers, the chances are you can maybe only get a part of someone's um, information if you manage to compromise a server. Um, it's very scalable. I've given an example of this um, at the bottom of the slide. Um, you can run a Colab server on a Raspberry Pi device for a couple of users. Um, on a, the caveat in there is let's hope they're not concurrent. Uh, but you can have a couple of users on a Colab server on a Raspberry Pi device, including the web client, the whole, the whole lot. Um, or you can put it in a server farm and run it for millions of users. Um, and I know of examples of both of these ends of the scale. I have a Raspberry Pi on my, in fact, I have two Raspberry Pis on my desk at home. And I know of very, very large millions of users' deployments. Um, it's standards-based. Um, all of the components that make a Colab server um, do not talk to each other in some proprietary language that the rest of the industry does not understand. Um, they all talk to each other using known standards, which is very important because this means, for example, if you do not like the open LDAP that, that we ship with Colab, you have the option to say, I don't like open LDAP, but I do like 389 directory server, or I do like God forbid, Microsoft Active Directory. Um, you can pick what you like and throw it in there because they all just speak standards. And it's 100% free software, which is, I'm an advocate of free software. There's a million, and re million reasons I could tell you why you should make any piece of free software. Um, but in the case of groupware, because it's handling your data, it's your life, this is all your personal information, why would you put that in the hands of technology that you have to put faith in? 
Um, the great thing about free software is you can, you can analyze it. You can know that it's handling your data properly. So this is very important in the groupware space. On the client side, as I said before, our primary uh, client is uh, KDE's contact. In fact, contact was built specifically to work with the Colab server originally. Um, contact's great. Um, it works extremely well on Linux, as you'd expect. Um, there are installers, which means it works reasonably well on Windows. Um, in theory, it works on OS X, but if you can actually make it build on OS X, you are, you are, you are a magician, quite frankly. Um, I know of a couple of people out there, but in theory, it's possible. Um, Thunderbird's also a client. There is a, there is a plugin called Sync Colab for Thunderbird that allows you to talk to Colab servers. Um, Evolution has a project that was funded by the German government to make Evolution speak to Colab servers. And if you are very desperate, and quite often people in industry are desperate, you can continue to use Outlook with plugins for Outlook as well. Um, and then we've got mobile phone synchronization. We actually use our own, um, our own flavor of uh, ActiveSync. Um, it's a project that we actually collaborate with another free software project in order to, to make happen. Um, which means everyone out there who basically has any modern mobile phone can sync their content from a Colab server to their mobile phone. So that was Colab. Now KDE, um, I'll skip through this pretty quickly because you've heard a lot already. KDE started life as a desktop project. Um, it's not anymore. Um, the desktop is part of the overall picture. Um, KDE these days, so this is, this is my definition, not everyone will necessarily um, subscribe to this, but it's, it's a free software project of user-facing technologies um, integrated. Um, and everything that supports them. So we work on other technologies which the user does not necessarily see, but supports the technology that they do. Um, many contributors over the lifetime of the project, it's a very large project, a lot of code. I'm not gonna say too much more than that. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of what, when I'm talking about groupware, what do I actually mean? Um, computer supported collaboration. Um, there's a specific term out there which is computer supported uh, cooperative work. I tend to avoid that because cooperative work normally suggests uh, real-time collaboration. Now, real-time collaboration I'll come back to um, is only really something that's up and coming in the groupware world. That, that's very much modern PIM as opposed to the classic PIM. Um, groupware um, it has very complex design considerations because of the um, elements of all the components that you have to work together because it's not just the case of I have email and I have a calendar and I have a to-do list and I have contacts. These things actually have to work together. They're not sitting there in their own right. So there's some very complex design decisions. And more importantly, these have to work for the users and quite often um, disparate groups of users. Um, quite often companies are very good at um, putting together teams of similar people um, and you can configure your groupware to support the workflow for that team. But if you have a, a larger company with a greater number of teams, maybe bigger teams where the teams are not so homogenous, um, your groupware has to be configurable enough that it really works for the individual within those teams and support their needs, which gives you some very interesting work that has to go on in the user interface to make it flexible enough to do the work for the team as a whole. Yes, these days it has to be both asynchronous and, uh, and synchronous, um, purely because of the way data is moving. And most importantly, must be these days offline capable. Um, if you have the groupware which is web-based only, um, you're not so useful for the company director who gets on a flight and still needs to be able to write email or play with his calendar. So, the current situation, but this is the, the classic PIM model. We have um, email, calendaring, to-do list, contacts. Like I said before, these are things that do not just sit by themselves. These have to work together. The example I always give, because people in their day-to-day -day life don't necessarily do a lot of work in groupware, is you have to imagine you, um, you get an email inviting you to an event. You can create an event in your calendar from that email you can invite somebody who's in your contacts list to that event. Um, this is the kind of way in which these things have to work together. It's not just they're in there in their own right. They talk to each other. Now, as far as KDE goes, in terms of these uh, different content types, 
As part of uh, the KD4 project, one of the what we called the pillars of KD4 was to say, well, how do we handle all this data in a sort of unified fashion? In KDE 3, all the different PIM individual applications, the email app, the calendar app, they all handled the data themselves in their own way. There was no common store for PIM data. Um, and what we said with KDE 4 is there's something kind of broken there. We need to be able to handle this data in a unified manner, um, not least of which because we need this data to integrate. We need the, the different data types to talk to each other. And the Akonadi project was born. Now, Akonadi is um, essentially, it's a client-side cache. Um, it um, provides an API to applications and provides a plugin interface for resources which grab the actual data. So you have resources that go and fetch the content of that blog or go and get your items from your Twitter or email or whatever. Um, you can write resources for pretty much anything. But all they do is they go, they grab the data, and they stick it in a database, and then most importantly, it then gets indexed. Um, and my favorite part of this is, if you have an email grabbed and it's, uh, it's um, encrypted, and then at the moment you decrypt that email, it then gets indexed, um, which is great, because it means, for example, if you then try and do a search for stinky tofu, um, and that was appeared in, a, in a, an encrypted email, that will get returned as part of the search. Um, because it knows to start indexing that content as soon as it's been uh, as soon as it's been decrypted, and this is a project that's now been around for um, since 2006 on the client side. Um, it's becoming these days a very mature um, and actually very lightweight piece of technology. Modern data. So as I said before, we can use Akinadi to sync anything. Quite frankly. So why not have it, you know, grab your, your Java conversations? Why not get it to grab the logs from those so you have indexed conversations? Why not get it to grab the content that you do put on Facebook, on Foursquare, on Twitter, in your blog, wherever you're putting data these days and it's getting lost, it's getting thrown away? Well, why not take that back? That's your data. Why should you allow it get lost in somebody else's service? It's you. It's your life, right? So. I want that back, quite frankly. And this is what um, Akinari really allows you to do. It's, it's, you're allowed to carry your stuff around with you wherever you go. And you don't need to worry about it getting lost in some service over there. Including on devices like the Vivaldi tablet. It's lightweight enough that you can actually carry your life around with you in your hands. Um, which is excellent, again, for the offline message. If you happen to be on the plane and you don't want to take out your massive laptop, you just want to be able to respond to that email or put that event in your calendar, even on small devices you can do this because Akinadi is very lightweight. In fact, there's been projects recently specifically designed to make it lightweight enough to run on very restricted mobile devices, um, which is really important because literally you can have your life in your hands and you can take it around with you and you don't need to worry about if it's going to get lost over there or if that service is going to get taken away from you, you have control over your data. So I tried to think of like a worked example of, so before I described like putting an event in your calendar, so I tried to think of the worked example of how you can now work with modern data. So I got an email from Franklin saying, you know, we've accepted your talk, we would love to come, love for you to come to Taiwan and, and talk about groupware. Um, so I, I put this event in my calendar, I created to-dos um, to remind me to book a hotel, to book flights. Um, you know, I had a conversation about what to, what to do in Taiwan, which you know, led me to the Damper Baby. Um, all of this coming together now of, of the new data, so we're now integrating the, the chat logs. Um, you, know, you could then create the, the flight uh, information on your tablet, um, you can attach the hotel reservation to the to-do you've already created. Yeah, you could then you know, push that event out to Twitter to say, I am going to this event. There's all these things you can now do with, with the, the, the new data types that are, that are out there, that at the moment is just content that's getting lost. I mean, imagine the example of, I don't know, because I had this, this conversation with Franklin about uh, the damper baby and I couldn't remember the name. I mean, I could theoretically pull something out of a log where he'd mentioned the damper baby and send an email not in response to another email 
but I could send an email in response to something that happened in the Jabber log. So when I created the email, instead of having at this date and this time you said, I could in theory have at this date and this time in Jabber you said and respond to that. Or you tweeted, or you checked in at this location. Why not, right? And this is where we're heading with Colab 3. Colab 3 is the next major um, change, the next major release of, of Colab. It's due out sometime in the coming months. And over the life cycle of Colab 3 as a whole, not just 3 naught, we really plan to make Colab a technology which allows you to protect your data and your life and your information. Um, as part of this, there's a few things we're not changing. Um, the Colab storage will continue to be Cyrus IMAP. Um, we use Cyrus basically as a NoSQL storage. A lot of people, when they don't know Colab, get surprised by that, but everything gets stored, all the actual data gets stored in Cyrus. So effectively, all your PIM data is just an attachment to an email. Uh, and we're going to continue to do this forever. Um, a couple of things have to change. The way we handle LDAP um, has to change in Colab 3. At the moment, uh, in Colab 2, LDAP data is very much tied to uh, open LDAP, um, which is not very useful when someone comes along and says, well, I already have Active Directory in place, which is not uncommon, or I already have Netscape Directory Server, or I already have Sun Directory Server. Most people already have LDAP in place, so we've had to really fix the way Colab works with LDAP so that we can integrate with whatever happens to be already in place. We have a shiny new web client. Um, until now, the web client used to be uh, the Horda project, and we've moved to Vancube. Um, it's more web 2.0, for a want of a better phrase. Mobile Sync is being improved. We have a whole new stack that we're working on with another free software project to bring Active Sync to Colab. And most importantly, because it's the buzzword of the, the week, um, we are now getting ready for the cloud. Um, Colab 2, in theory, wasn't cloud ready um, because there were certain components which spoke to each other through a pipe. Um, we have now broken this, so all the components speak to each other over the network, um, making it as cloud ready as we possibly can. Over the lifetime of Colab 3, so maybe in 3.1, 3.2 and so on, there's a few things that we're going to improve. Um, we will bring Jabber actually as a component. Um, right now there's nothing to stop you installing Jabber side by side with your Colab, but we're actually going to start um, shipping it to make it as easy as possible. Integration with OwnCloud is going to be done, which we're quite excited about. Um, An integration with OwnCloud, for example, means that um, when you create an email and you want to do an attachment for that email, instead of uploading from your, from your local machine, you could in theory say, attach from own cloud and similarly you could actually um, you could actually as something comes in you could save that attachment to your own cloud rather than putting it on your local machine and you can do some other pretty cool stuff as well so instead of actually attaching it you could in theory provide a link um, to that object in your own cloud rather than actually um, sending it over the network thus saving yourself quite a lot of bandwidth Here's the big deal. So until now, I talked about Akinadi as a client technology. Um, at some point in Colab 3, the intention is to make Akinadi a server-side technology. Um, so this is taking something that used to be seen as a client-only technology from KDE and very much putting it onto the server as part of the Colab project. Um, so that uh, anyone who has the um, web-based experience of Colab can have all the same benefits as if they were a contact user. Um, contact is still very much our, our favorite client, but we want a unified approach to everyone, no matter which client they happen to be using. Which means for us, more importantly, is putting uh, Akinadi on the server so that um, even if you don't have the, the mobile device or your laptop, at least through the web, you still have all of your content under your control um, on a Colab server. Um, Putting um, Akinadi on the server does open up to some interesting new workflow. Like I said before, for example, um, being able to say at such a date and time you tweeted, um, it opened up sort of all sorts of possibilities for how you handle this new data. And in theory, by putting um, uh, Akinadi on the server, it very much simplifies client development because it, pr it 
puts forward is a cache with one API basically. So all of a sudden you don't have multiple clients um, trying to implement multiple caches, multiple APIs. If you think about um, on the server alone, you've at least got the mobile sync client and you've got the web client. Well, all of a sudden they have one cache, one API that they need to talk rather than trying to build their own caches. In short, um, it's the first step in allowing all Colab users, not just the desktop client users, to take control of all of their data. Um, and coupled with the fact that it's 100% free software and will remain that way, um, it's a big deal. It's a very important thing and we're really excited about it. Because after all, this is your data and you should not feel bad about wanting that under your control. Um, you should not feel bad about the fact that when you give that photograph to, to Facebook or to Google+, Plus, you might not necessarily ever see it again. Um, if you give it to a piece of free software, it's yours. It will stay yours. It will always be yours. It's a long road ahead. Um, we are very much a, a growing project. We're always looking for people to work on code, documentation, translations. Um, if you're interested and want to ask me any questions or learn a bit more about what we do, um, please feel free to come and speak with me afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure if I listened correctly. Uh, did you mention uh, Colab is planning to support ActiveSync in the future? Yeah, so it, it already supports ActiveSync and it's in the 2.4, which is the current stable release. Uh -huh. uh, we have an ActiveSync um, which is actually provided by uh, Zarafa. It's called ZPush. So Zarafa is another um, open source groupware. Um, it's not 100% free software, it's, they have an open core model, so you, you get the core technology, but then if you want to do this, then it's a proprietary add-on. If you want to do that, it's a proprietary add-on. And um, they have a, a free software version of ActiveSync, um, which we, at, at the time we started looking at ActiveSync, because previously we did SyncML. Uh, when we started looking at ActiveSync, at the time they had the best open source stack available. Um, we're now actually changing away from that because we found the actual relationship between the Zarafa community and the Colab community didn't work so well. Um, but yeah, so we already have ActiveSync and in Colab 3, it will be a different um, ActiveSync. But yes, it's already in there. Okay, 其, 其他朋友有还有问题吗? 想要发问的? Thank you, Adam. Thank you.